where I'm doing more horseshoe shaped plantings facing up towards the sun. So the open end of the horseshoe is to the sun and I get shelter from the northeast and the northwest, which are our really bad winds. So mm -hmm. do you think that would work to have instead of rows and rows of trees for the alley cropping, having more I, like I, a little I, island and using the same I, principles? I believe it's it's all valuable. It's all valid. Uh, we used to do a lot of, um, uh, we used to call them mandalas, you know, circles, yes. little circle forests. And yep. then that would, that would add up and it would kind of join up, you know, before we started doing the alley crop, you know, systems. Yeah. Um, we, you find that, you know, as you build up organic matter, you know, this water doesn't run, you know, pick up that okay. kind of speed and wash so much Fine. stuff as you can build organic matter. And, and there are systems where, you know, you, you can have your lines, you know, horizontal to, to stop that, you know, so surely alley cropping as well, you know, on a horizontal, maybe how steep it is, you can't get a tractor or it's not nice to, to walk sideways. So a lot of people still do uphill alley cropping, but you, you do need a lot of organic matter and you need, do need to work a lot of wood, you know, in the paths so that it doesn't create, you know, uh, so that the rain doesn't doesn't create that kind of... Yeah, one, one idea uh, for that situation is that, like, if you have to do, uh, if you have to work upwards uh, the hill, you could do rows across every certain amount of meters so they wouldn't be your main rows right but you would do some of them which would be initial barriers just to slow down water oh, okay speed. yeah yes so that would already eliminate much of the erosion problem as you work the system and you have a good ground cover both of living plants and and organic matter and you have a well-structured soil then you're gonna you won't have any problems with uh Thank you. And erosion anymore, so. right. Yes, it's heavy clay underneath a very thin layer of topsoil. But I appreciate what you're saying. That that's a good idea. I suppose you could also have the short rows, the horizontal rows, kind of overlapping, um, so that there's no gap in the middle of between. Definitely, yeah. you that could do that. That sounds very feasible. Yeah. Yeah, you need you need to think about mm -hmm. having pathways so that you can walk around so that it's. it's you yes. know, you you don't have a uh, difficulty walking around later right. on. So, okay, yeah, that's right. Again, Just to let everybody know, to we see are a video. already live on YouTube, right? So be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jill, we'd love to see a video sometime if you can post it either in, in the Discord or anything like that. So, we, so we we visualize, you know, what's happening. And I was going to ask you, sometimes when you have those areas which you can, which you must preserve with, you know, uh, with all the natural um, plants and things like that, uh, sometimes you're able to plant natural. Yes. yes. So you are able to I, add I've trees been, that are. Yes, I've been getting um, native New Zealand trees which are threatened. Um, because they've been good for timber and they've been logged too heavily in the past. So I've been getting some of those and planting just small numbers, but most of them are very large trees when they're mature, very large trees. So I have to be careful where I plant those. But yes, it's, it's good. And I do access the soil from the government. I steal a little bit occasionally because of the fungi and the microzoa um, for planting native trees in my syntropy system because I think it's good if I can integrate local trees. Well, I'm sure that's fair. Um, or, and even if you find any, any fruit trees which you can, native fruit trees that you're able to harvest and then you can actually, you know, have things where you can actually harvest obviously the seeds from, from your timber wood and things like that, and fine. That'd be great. And just, just on, a, on another note about Gareth, that would be a great neighbor to have. I'm really looking forward to coming here. Yes. Yeah, where is he? I, I, I shaved my head just to keep him no, company. That would be nice. The, the bald people's area. Nice, I didn't know. He, he's moving, is he?
Is Gareth moving? He's confirmed he's moving house and going to this new venture or something like that we don't know about? I haven't heard from him. Um, I'm actually having trouble accessing Patreon. I got onto it originally, but when I go back now, I can't write, type in messages. I had one original message to Gareth and he replied. And then since then, I haven't been able to, like my, my slot comes up with my name, but it's grayed out. So I can't, nothing happens when I try and type in it. So I'll have to have another look at that. Strange. But you did access and, and access the link for today. So you're able to log in. Yeah. Yeah. Strange. So, yeah. All right. If you have any further trouble, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Um, so I think we should uh, dive right into the questions, right? We've got quite a few questions today, so that's going to be pretty, pretty groovy. Right? Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so first, I never know if I need to start from... The top or the bottom is from the top. Yeah. So first question is from Amar. He he it, he said, continuing from discussion on Discord, how profitable are centropic farms across the globe, and how can they be profitable? In my case, growing exotics is the option I have chosen. However, it's a high risk option because I'm not sure how well some of the plants I have chosen will grow in my region. If I grow regular produce, then I will be competing against thousands of other farmers. And let me just follow through with Peter's. Uh, he made a comment right underneath it. So he said, but on the other hand, you have to create a whole access to the market for your exotic products, crops. Whereas I think producing regional regular produce already has the market access on which you can then specify on the higher, more expensive, more valued crops that come from ecologically responsibly farming, like the agroforestry approach. Are there any recommendations how to balance these options? So this is a this is a topic that that actually is, it's worth making a whole video about this because it is a it, it it's such an extensive topic, and I, I think there are two two different subjects that we can attack here. The first one is about the specific profitability of tropic farms. And the other one about this thing of choosing a more niche specific crop or conventional crops. Uh, to start with, I like to, th this is something that comes up a lot. People ask, oh, are isentropic systems profitable? And the fact of the matter is that when you go into centropic systems or you know any sort of agroforestry system, it's it's such a you have such a vast diversity of different of systems that you can you can create. It's not as simple as saying oh producing lettuce is profitable at this scale. With agroforestry, you you can have many different kinds of agroforestry systems and you're going to have some of them which will be successful and some of them which will not and just like any other enterprise most enterprises in the world will fail including centropic enterprises that's uh, that's a fact that we cannot simply deny and the the, the big thing about making it prop because what's the risk of of agroforestry, of, of a centropic system, is that you make something more complex than it can be viable. And this is a fact. If, you're making, if you make something very complex, it won't be viable uh, financially because if you're not able, for me, the, 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 the threshold is this. There's our man, Gareth, coming in. Uh, in your, like, if you idealize your system, your agroforestry system, are you able to create standard operational procedures for all the operations in the system? Can you delegate tasks easily? If you can't, that means 
you as the owner of the system has to be present there all the time in order to make all the small decisions that need to be made. And that, that's not a problem, but you will, be, you will have a very, um, you have a very short limit to how much you can expand that system because if you cannot delegate, you, you cannot grow. So what happens is that when we start working towards larger scale commercial systems, we have to simplify systems a lot in the sense that you have one or two main crops Right. Usually we have one main crop, one secondary crop, and that's that. And all the other species, they are there specifically for service purposes. In that way, you can have a profitable system, no doubt. And, uh, but you need, to, you need to focus. You need to have focus. You cannot think that oh, I'm going to have this you know, 10, 15 different crops because that's going to give my system more resilience but then you're gonna fall dead when you try to sell the produce because you won't be able to hold the market. You won't have scale to move your product unless you're doing uh, like farmer's market sales. But then, like I said, this is a, uh, like a, it's a small thing. Like if you're taking 10, 12 different products to the farmer's market, you know, maybe you yourself is doing that. That's like a, a small family run business that could work. But as soon as you try to, to, to build a bigger scale, more company-like, you need to simplify and you need to have scale so that you can move products in large quantities. Just to give you an idea, I'm working with a, with a, a farm here in Bahia. I started working with them a couple of months ago and they're a somewhat large farm, not super big for Brazil standards. But they're gonna be, we're gonna be implementing 150 hectares of agroforestry. So there's probably gonna be a lot of content I'm gonna be publishing about. With the main focus on citrus and um, avocado and a little bit of coffee. But we're gonna have different, uh, different modules in the farm. Like we're gonna have one module which will be focused on avocado with coffee as a secondary crop. And then I'm gonna have a module which will be focused on citrus. And one thing that the guy, was, one of the owners of the farm was telling me is, which kind of opened up my eyes for the, the citrus business. He, he said, because one of the project, one of the main crops is lime. He said, look, I need, in order to have enough, um, enough scale to export, because that's one thing he wants to do. He wants to be exporting to, to, to Europe. I need to have at least a hundred hectares of, of lime so that I can fill in the shipments every week, because if I don't have it every week, then I don't get the clients. So I need to have that every week. So it's important to understand who's your client. You need to supply all of those clients' demands. So for example, if you're supplying vegetables to a market in your, in your city, you need to have that every week. So you need to, to develop your system and to design it so that you, you fill up that specific niche and this is this is uh like this is is it's it's business knowledge it's not even about agroforestry or, or agriculture or anything it's about any sort of business you need to understand that part of the equation in order to have a success a successful business and i think this is a something that many people who, who want to do this as a business but they fail to grasp this part of the equation and then they, they try, they, they create the most ideal agroforestry system, but in the sense of enriching the system and the complexity and the biodiversity, but then that's not very efficient in terms of logistics and, and, and marketing and all of that. So we need to find this balance. So I say we need to, to make the most complex system we can which is still financially viable. That's, that's the goal which I, which I set for any project I get involved with. So let's try to be as, you know, create as much complex systems, but making things easier for us. We need to make our lives easier. Um, and then about this thing of using these exotic or niche species or 
more conventional crops. This is a matter of, of choice, I'd say, because, in, and also depending on the, on the scale, on the size of the, of the land you have, because if, you, if you're working with very unique crops, you, you, maybe you don't need such a large area in order to have something which is uh, lucrative because you, you have a high uh, revenue per area because you have a, a very valuable product, right? So for example, I, I will, I've been studying recently um, the blueberry market here in Brazil, which is a crop that's uh, kind of beginning to, to become more common. Uh, it, it's only produced in the south of Brazil. It has only been produced in the south of Brazil for you know, the past years, and it's not very common, even there. Blueberry and, and, and raspberry. And now it's starting to be grown in other places. Um, in Brasilia, there's one producer, I think in Minas Gerais, there's another, there's a couple here in Bahia, mainly in, in high altitude places. So the blueberry crop for us here is quite interesting because we, we harvest blueberry while America, the North America and the United States don't have blueberry because we're right, we grow, you know, we harvest in different because of the, the inverted season. So this fills in a gap of the, of the lack of blueberry in European markets because here in Brazil, nobody knows about blueberry or very few people do. And it's expensive as hell. Nobody can buy it. Only very rich people can buy it because it's just, off the charts expensive, but you, and it's very expensive to establish one hectare of blueberry. It's hugely expensive, but at the same time, the re revenue is very big. So if you have like one, one hectare of blueberry, that's already a huge operation. If you have half a hectare, that's already a pretty big operation. But if you grow in, you know, bananas, one hectare is nothing, you know, it's not such a big operation. And so it's, it's really a, a matter of, of choosing a strategy depending on your location and trying to, you know, and you have to understand your location, the, the, the market, the local market, the size of your land, because the size of your land will determine a lot of what you can and what you cannot do. Because, you know, depending on the size, you will be limited to your local market. And then if you are limited to your local market, you have to, to understand what sort of demands they have, or you have to invent a demand, which is also a possibility. Or I'm, I'm going to grow, I don't know, well, for example, blueberry here in Brazil, and I will, I will make people like blueberry. I'm going to have to invest in marketing and I'm going to bring the benefits of blueberry. It's not common. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very expensive, but I will market the people who can pay and I will find a way to sell this. I will create the market. It's risky, but if you manage to do it, you're gonna get a nice bounty when you start selling because you're the only one. So it's really a, a matter of you know, marketing strategies and choosing the best route depending on the, on the condition. So yeah. That was a lot of... Uh, yeah, very well said. A lot of talk. <laughs> very well said, Felipe. Um, you know, my thoughts on... We, we, always, we always advise in, you know, uh, relating to, you know, primary and secondary crops, simplifying systems to make them viable in, in the scale necessary. Uh, one thing is it's important for us to, to note Sometimes we have a main and a secondary crop, but these crops, they're gonna kick in, you know, they're gonna bear fruit in five to seven years, a lot of the times. So we can plan to have a primary and secondary crop. Wait, like we in, can't hear you, I can't hear you at least. Am I cutting out? Is it only me? Guys, can everybody hear Gennaro? I can hear him. Well, that's funny, because I can hear everybody, but I can't hear him. All right, you, you okay, sure, now, Felipe? Now it's working. No, no, right. now it's working. Cool, Sorry. cool. 
<clears throat> so, you know, what, what I'm saying is we have primary and secondary crops and a lot of times this will bear fruit, you know, five, seven years later. So it is interesting as well. It, we don't want to com complexify it, but it is interesting to have a primary and secondary crop in the early stages as well. Obviously, we have all the service plants required, but for example, papayas and bananas, you know, can, can pay the way into your harvest, your avocados. You know, it's very clear to me that avocados is my, is my main crop and, you know, my secondary crop is coffee, but I'm not waiting around seven years for that. We're harvesting papayas and bananas in the same system. So we have kept it, uh, we've not complexified it because it's not all in once and it's not all managing the same kind of uh, vegetation all in once. So we can we can't even do it in two or three stages if there is a market available. That would be ideal. You know, uh, it's not just romantic, but that would be ideal that you, by the time you get to your avocados, it, the system has been paid for from earlier crops. So as much as we're careful not to make it too complex, we're still able to make uh, good use of succession of species and have early harvests of fruit, even with three years stint of uh, banana and papayas, you know, harvest before we achieve, you know, uh, the long-term goal of avocados and, and, and coffees, for example. And ideally, if, you know, if you do have, obviously the, the, there's a scale and, um, and there's a means to an end, but obviously if you have a market for an even earlier crop, so it's all down to what's your market. And, and in that case, you know, really, really focusing on, on what is the local markets because it's quite complex to open a market for something that's, that's, uh, that's, that's going to pass, you know. So, for example, you know, if, if you're going to establish your avocados for long term, that's cool, but you're not going to open a market for something that's just going to be there for a year and a half or two years, you know, something that you, you're reaching, uh, it's something that's just part of the road for your main crop in the future. Um, and certainly, I mean, when we're talking about profitability in agroforestry systems, you, you do optimize for real um, in, your, in your medium to long term as you generate, you know, your, your own energy, as you, as you generate your own mulch within. It is very clear that I have never gone back to manure my coffees, for example, and I've never gone back to manure to fertilize my avocados, you know, and obviously this is a legacy of, of the stuff that came before that. So it is a very robust system with, as long as you're careful not to complexify it, to understand your market and all the things that Felipe said, um, but there are for sure solid results and, and solid concrete benefits and ease to profitability. If you do pick correctly your main crop, you, if you do have all the marketing and all the market strategies in place, you are optimizing with agroforestry and you do tend to have a future as, as if you go down the road of, you know, other style agriculture where it's not, you know, dealing with processes of life, less guarantees, are, you know, it's, it's, it's very clear there's less guarantees that what's going to happen in five, 10 years from now, less waters, because I'm counting in a, in a situation that I might not have any water in 10 years from now. So, I'm secure that I'm building robust systems. You know, that when it does rain, we're going to retain enough water. Because I can't depend on irrigation for the next, you know, for 10 years from now. Imagine I do a system that depends on irrigation and, you know, 10 years from now, there's no more water in the well. Well, so, so with agroforestry, we are working towards, you know, robust systems and, and well structured for the future, uh, that doesn't look very pretty, you know, in, in the direction that we're going very rapidly. 
And, uh, and then, I mean, in the topic of exotic or non-exotic, it's very personal. This is what makes uh, you an individual. This is what gives the personality to your forest, to your systems, because we are all also developing. We've got so much to back up what we're saying because we've been doing it for a decade and there's other people that have been doing it for two, three decades and you know we can look around and see what's happening so we have so much to back up but you know it's still new technology we still count on people to take the, ch the chance take the risk you know it's not so much about it being exotic is it adapted you know i wouldn't plant whether it's exotic or not if it's not adapted you couldn't bet on that to be your main crop it's too high of a risk and uh and you'll understand your local ease to shift this product I personally, from doing a lot of local markets, you know, local food stool markets, I love having that little variety and things uh, for the competition. It's nice, but really you don't sell boxes of it, you know? So it's very clear to me, as long as it's nice, and I do have because my farm uh, from, from before, there was someone else who lived there and he had all these nice different varieties, which which is nice. I go and pick off this one tree and pick off that one tree and it all adds to what I take to the market and, and it makes it attractive and everything. However, I'm not selling boxes of it. Whether if I sell, if I take boxes of bananas and boxes of tomatoes, it, it will sell, you know? So I do have the tendency to enjoy producing what everyone eats, you know? I, personally, I've gone down this route and I've taken a lot of risks. Uh, I try a lot of things, but in my experience in the local, even in a small scale situation, I know that we sell boxes of what everyone wants to eat. Tomatoes, beans, you know, bananas, strawberries, whatever, mangoes, avocados, you know, things like that. And when, you know, and exotic stuff, when we produce them, sometimes we have to, you know, really talk to the customer and explain, and one or other will choose to take that, but it's not um, as easy to shift, even though it's, it's lovely to have. Thanks. I'm muted. I forgot I was muted. Yeah, that's a, nice. that's a very great point, man. Uh, MR followed up with uh, just a comment. I'm going to read it here so that everybody can hear it. She had interesting thought. In my case, I don't plan to produce huge quantities of exotics, rather have a variety of fruits at reasonable quantities because I see there are customers for rare fruits. But if I grow regular stuff, then I may not get good price. Probably it's good to balance it though, to give that safety with regular produce. Yeah, that's good. Apparently, he knows his uh, his market. He's researching to see what the market will take best, and that's of course uh, a, a very wise thing to do. Um, Eric asked uh, three questions. First one, good question. I was thinking about this today. He said, "Last year, you talked about a new agroforestry course 2.0. Are there still plans to introduce this new course?" Yes, most certainly there is that plan. Um, I'm going to be with Gennaro in person and probably next week or so I'm going to be in Brasilia. So we, we're, we're taking down some trees in his farm and we're probably going to be discussing a lot of, of the Agroforestry Academy prospect as well and what we're going to be doing for the next few months. So yes, that is still uh, planned. So hold tight that soon we're going to definitely going to have some information about that. Yeah, it's been a long time. Philippe and I have been together for, for, for you know, several days. So that's going to be exactly. great. Fun. And we do also, you know, count on our patrons to help us guide through this sometimes. I think we're probably going to be getting together, have a couple of days, and we might even hit you guys, you know, you know to know what direction would be appreciated. You know, that would exactly. be, be an interesting as well. So we will be soon yeah. wanting to hear from you guys as well. Cool. And then Eric asked about eucalyptus. Uh, so planting eucalyptus to produce essential oil off the leaves, does that make a difference how to plant it in the system? 
because the pruned trees normally stay in the, in the system as organic matter. With producing essential oil from the leaves, the there is less organic matter left for the system. That's not necessarily true because you can bring back the, all the matter, right? Because you're going to extract the oil and then you have to do something with all of that organic matter from which the oil was extracted. So you can just take that right back into the system. Um, the difference that does exist is that people usually plant uh, at a very uh, much denser spacing when it is for oil production. And they will take down the whole tree and shred everything, uh, including the wood, and the oil will be extracted from everything. So, if if you're if producing essential oil is not your main business, you could just get away with getting the oil from the from the top, and then you just prune it like a regular agroforestry. If it is your main business, you're probably going to want to get the wood as well because there's quite a decent amount of oil there. But then if you are running uh, an essential oil business, you're definitely going to want to consortiate eucalyptus with some other species, especially herbs, because they would go along very nicely. The eucalyptus oil is very cheap, but then you've got stuff like, uh, like uh, what's the name of the... Um, Tea trees. These. Yeah, tea trees and uh, look. damn it, I completely forgot the name of that plant. That's uh, hang on, guys. Um, anyway, you there are all sorts of herbs that produce essential oil. So, but the one I'm thinking about is lavender. Of course, completely missed. Uh, I, I got a blank from that name because here in Brazil, we actually have two names for that plant. One is lavanda, but then the other is alfazema. It's the same plant, so anyway. So lavender, it's got good price. And then you've got uh, a lot of other stuff like all sorts of mints and other herbs. These all grow very well in the understory of the forest so you know as a low stratum as a kind of a ground cover so that you could have them with eucalyptus and then you've got other species which uh, are also emergent species which will produce essential oil you know trees here in brazil we've got rosewood which produces a very expensive oil it probably should grow in your place as well eric uh, it's uh, Aniba Rosiodora, if I'm not wrong. I'm going to write it down. Aniba Rosiodora. Then I'm going to check. Not Anita, Aniba. Aniba Rosiodora. I need to check that name, but I think that's it. And um, anyway, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the idea. But that's, you know, the, the organic matter thing won't change because you can just bring it back to the, to the place. I mean, I find it really fun in the, in the prospect of working with eucalyptus and, and exploring it for, for other stuff other than mulch, because we've had so much fun with it in the past, you know, with the whole double canopy stuff, you know, if, you, if you're actually pruning the, you know, the, the canopy up there, you know, whatever, four, 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 five meters high, if you're pruning it regular enough, there is enough light to come in to feed that second canopy, because I, I've done a, a system where we've we pruned it, you know, the comfortable height where, you know, where you, where you, without using any ladders, you're just standing there and you prune it at the comfortable height and then you've created a knot there. And then eventually I've let another one grow and now we've got, you know, the double canopy thing going on. It's just fun. That, that's just, you know, uh, and, well, not common, but, you know, you could, you could think of something like that where one, one, one layer is for mulching, the other layer for harvesting. You know, and obviously, um, when, when, when you are exploring the system for harvest, and it's usually a crop that's, that takes a lot out of the system, a crop that you use for mulch because it's very aggressive in biomass production. So it, it is robbing from the system if you don't give it back. Often we've just come to the conclusion, you know, just plant double the plants and, and every other plant 
is to feed back and want to harvest, want to feed back and want to harvest. You know, I've been doing a lot of this with the Napier systems. I've had negative experience where I've over harvested Napier from the system and I've drained it. And now all my systems, you know, they've calculated this line is for the system, this line is for harvest, this line is for the system, this one's for harvest. So, you know, every other plant, anything like that would work. Um, you know, you could want to have a situation where your eucalyptus is at an easy height to harvest. So you have it at a two meter to 20 height where you're harvesting and then, you know, have other emergent trees, something like leucayenes and things like that, doing that, that, uh, that emergent strata at the top. Because eucalyptus are so robust, you know, if there's some light coming in, you know, you can be, you know, really harvesting them really low you know, at that kind of like, try hold it at that medium strata. Not that it's not going to try to push up. And that's what's great about it. It's going to be trying and pushing and pushing and you can harvest at a comfortable height. You know, if you don't have it as an emergent tree, uh, I probably would do something like that. So it's just fun because eucalyptus is so robust and, you know, you can really chain sword that down and the re-sprouting is so fabulous that it's just something that you probably also would, you know, create something unheard of. It has that kind of power to, you know, for you to respond uh, with all sorts of mad situations. So that would be quite fun playing around with that. I'm muting myself and forgetting to unmute. So uh, one more question from Eric about castor being just like an annual. So yes, it does grow back from pruning. Uh, it responds very well to pruning. You can prune it several times and it will continue to produce organic matter. It is a, it's not a, exactly a perennial because it's got a somewhat of a short lifespan of maybe two years or so, but you can harvest seeds for, for a while. Your limit will be the other the, the the succession of species in your system because as an emergent species if you if another emergent from a, a uh, um from the following stage of succession reaches the same height as the castor bean and wants to take over you will have to eliminate the castor bean or ask the other species to wait and you know prune it back so that the castor bean can enjoy uh being at the top of the world for a while longer. But as soon as it is not at the top of the world anymore, it's gonna start feeling a bit, uh, a bit sad and it will reduce its health and, and production. So I actually, this is actually a pretty interesting thing for a video as well. I have this place in one of the plots where I didn't uh, eliminate the castor bean when I should have. And they are completely attacked by this small bug that eats its leaves. It's quite impressive because it, there are so many of these bugs, and they don't attack any of the plants, just the castor bean. That if you hit the plant, it's almost like it's raining because it's, these bugs start falling on you. It's kind of crazy. This is a good topic for a video. Uh, so yeah, the, these castor beans, they've been on the system for almost two years now. And I've never pruned them. I never did anything. And there's already other plants trying to take over. It. And then nature is, is uh, taking the responsibility to, to eliminate the castor bean. So it's a good, good question. Janar, we want to take the next one from Russell. Yep. There are two, two yep. questions from Russell. Yeah. What's up, guys? How do you guys deal with natural regeneration across the system? In the lines and in the walkways, alleys, I have read that regeneration that belongs to earlier consortiums can generate, can, can negatively affect the abundant crops. But maybe in the early stages of the system, a little shade and extra biomass production is a good thing. Also, this is a form, also, this is from a total cut on an early secondary forest systems. So the growth is from low trunks. Now, I quite appreciate, like you said, the re-sprout 
in in many ways it can you know shade off those fragile young planted crops um you know it's like that when, when it's like it's like doing the weeding sometimes you've got to weed something but you're like hold on there's nothing actually occupying that space is this weed really that bad or is it really helping me with the roots structuring is it really helping you know the system as a whole i see this often you know um where i've actually had for example uh mexican sunflower fields and you know bringing it all down and planting the forest and then the mexican sunflower coming back and taking over and you're really like kind of well what's happening in here but once you go inside you know it's really just shading everything nice you know it's, it's really looking after those seedlings because the resprouts of established trees and things like that and other vegetation tends to be a faster growth because it's already established roots and things like that so it it tends to be, you know, if it chooses to re-sprout, sometimes the tree chooses not to. Um, so I can't see much harm in that, you know. Uh, in alleys, maybe if you like want to mechanize something and, and you don't want this to re-sprout, um, you know, so that, you, you know, your tractor can't drive in for a certain situation, that could be an issue. All right. If it's like, if it's getting in the way, if it's some kind of tree that's going to re-sprout and it's in the way, of your project, but uh, you know, all of this re-sprout can be used in favor, you know, everything in the alley, you know, once it builds up that mass, use it to feed the lines. So it's like, you know, to work with the re-sprouts, it seems, you know, really valuable, uh, especially, especially if it's not occupying the same kind of layers, occupying the same aerial space from the crops that you intend to come through. So, so I think this is a bit of the key. Is it occupying, is, is that area of that re-sprout, is that, was that gonna be empty if that, you know, if that particular plant wasn't there? In that case, it's welcome if it's occupying a space that was, you know, uh, empty. So, and then, if, and then if it is, well then it's great anyway, because opportunity to be cutting and, and chopping, dropping, um, you know, things like that. So. I'm not particularly alarmed or, or scared or anything like that. It's quite appreciated. And in certain cases, it will be extremely appreciated and, and quite valuable weed sprouts because some of these trees that you probably brought down are really nice. Uh, they're valuable and, and, they're, and they're welcome. It's just because of that information of the old tree and how that will be reflecting negatively with all the new booming new shoots, new, new, new seedlings. So you need to have that radical prune to have all that re-sprout information, everything shooting fresh new. And then maybe, you know, this tree can be a part of the system in the medium long term, just not as it was before, not as an adult older tree. So cutting it down and, and having it grow back with the system, often it is welcome, you know, even things like fruit trees, you know, often there's that beautiful mango tree and, you know, you don't want to bring it down, but it's just that information is too negative. So bringing it down and having that mango come back and being part of, you know, of, of a nice, healthy fruit system. And this mango is going to be fabulous in the future. Again, great, you know, so, so re-sprouts, you know, of vegetation, you can work with it, make it work for you, you know, and, and in, in several ways, you know, I, I feel. Yeah, that's perfectly said. I'm just going to add in one thing, which uh, just to reinforce this thing about regrowth on paths and uh, unalign with the rows of trees. And uh, these I would highly recommend to, to, to cut them down. I have allowed them to grow for a very long time, you know, for the past, not a very long time, for the past couple of years, I try to allow regrowth in between the rows of trees and in the paths. And it's been a terrible decision because it's just, um, you, you can't keep up with it. You know, I say, oh, no, I'm gonna manage this, and, but then it's impossible because they start taking up too much space. So uh, conduct the re-sprout in your rows of trees. All the rest, if it's not aligned, if it's, if it's out of place, just then just keep cutting them down every time, but definitely, adopt all of the, re not only the re-sprouts, but also whatever the wind and the animals will bring 
pursue your rows of trees if it sprouts align with your system adopt them as long as like Gennaro said they're not taking up the space of your crops right so this is very welcome because we're never able to occupy all of the strata in all of the successional stages it's just I mean we can but it's it's virtually impossible because it's a lot of it's a lot of stuff. So we're, we always welcome the species that come of their own accord in order to fill up those spaces. Yeah. Yeah, and if it's a, if it's a bush information in, in the alleys in the corridors, that's that's less harm. That's okay because you use it, you know, like with with, with the with the chop and drop and the organic matter and obviously trees. You know, then you, you, you from from the start you, you start eliminating those. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, yeah, because in 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 the the book, I think it was uh, agroforestry the world uh, from Machete to uh, Tractor. I don't know if you guys have read that. It's a Brazilian guy as well. That, uh, but uh, yeah, that was my only question because you got we came in here and, and just took everything down and, and, and I had like a moment of illumination, you know, and where y'all were talking about, you're like, this is not a mu museum, you know what I'm saying? And uh, it was a pretty nice forest, you know, I, I was like, it, there's only like maybe three or four dominating species. It's an early, early secondary, you know, accumulation forest, a low, uh, low value trees, you know, that maybe some were four or five meters tall. And, uh, and I just say, you know, we're just going to cut everything down, man. We're going to take, we're just going to start all over, you know, and, uh, and I'll make, I'll make a movie. I'll make a video of it. A lot of, uh, biomass, really, really nice, uh, you know, biomass lined it up along the lines real nice, you know, and, um, uh, but I read in the in the in the manual and, and it had me thinking, you know, because it, it makes sense, I guess, you know, because you have like an older, like a, uh, an earlier system coming through and then you maybe maybe they, they don't grow so well with the, you know, with the corn and the tomatoes and the, uh, the next kind of generation, you know. Um, but I get you, uh, you know, I guess, you know, just protect what I understand what you guys said is just kind of protect the space of the trees and the plants that are coming through they they you uh they they plan it out right, um, so they're just not getting yeah. over shady, you know. They're not. Exactly. Yeah, and they, they will they will offer healthy competition, you know, growth hormones, you know, plants will play catch up with this. So depending, you know, things like uh, timberwood, they love you know some someone to chase, you know, and they, so so you can really benefit from it. And I thought it was quite funny, you, you, you know, you, you try and justify it there. You're like explaining to us is, this forest is like secondary, but it's okay, man. Like we say, you know, the problem is not cutting down trees. The problem is not planting them. So we're in peace. You know, you brought this area down and you're planting a lot more trees for sure. And I'm sure in the, in the medium long term, the animals are going to appreciate, you know, the, the varieties that you've planted that are probably more productive and everything. So it's cool. <laughs> yeah. No, no, and I'm happy I did, man. And and uh, but I'll tell you that here in uh, in Colombia, it, there's a lot of ignorance uh, about um, how nature works in in the country, you know. And uh, and I tell you, man, my wife almost, you know, when uh, when she came in because we one of the things that we liked it about this spot there's a lot of shade you know and uh and of course it was raining it was not real nice the first couple of days when we cut all everything down i was happy and everything and then of course you know we come into those six weeks of just like intense ass sun you know just like coming down every single day and just just sucking the you know? <laughs> man she almost killed me man <laughs> yeah you, but you i'm really the price yeah, you pay the price. Obviously, it's gonna suffer that sun coming into the best soil. You're preparing this, the soil for, so you pay the price temporarily. But you know, there's nothing like you know doing it, showing people. You know, in a couple of years from now, you know, people are looking and thinking, you know, we're aliens or whatever. I, I never forget, you know, the people in Portugal, our project out there. They thought we were aliens out there, planting everything crazy with all the vines and you know grapes and with all the crazy stuff, but, you know, go back there now and it's, you know, beautiful. It really is beautiful. They can't believe, you know, how come we've not sprayed nothing in these grapes. They can't believe it. So, you know, give it a couple of years and everyone's going to be 
asking you some questions and, and uh, try and understand how, how, how did you get, how did you achieve this? Yeah, that's yeah, that. for sure. But good, good thing your wife didn't kill you, man. That, that would be a, <laughs> that would be a big loss for the agroforestry movement. <laughs> All right, so, so. Uh, so, so next question from Russell. He, that's a pretty good question, by the way. So he said, I went ahead and planted everything at the same time by seed together from annual corn and beans to jack beans and guandu. Uh, guandu, for those of you who are not acquainted with uh, the, the Iberic languages, guandu is pigeon pea uh, to banana and avocado. About a month in some of the bananas and jack beans are growing up faster than the annual beans and corn and the guandu is getting there as well. Will the corn take off into its emergent strata, or if they were beat by the banana and jack beans, will they probably leave the system? How do you guys deal with this to produce annuals when the next consortium gets ahead of them? Granted, it has only happened in maybe 20% of the nest, so it is not a huge part of the planting. It's a pretty good question. Um, just before we, we jump right into, how did you plant the bananas? Did you plant them like we do with only the corn planted or did you plant them with the stem sticking out? <clears throat> uh, so I cut it, I cut it low and, and just planted the corn, uh, but I didn't, I didn't put it, I, I wasn't, I wasn't brave enough to put it facing all the way down. I put it like sideways and, okay. and it wasn't. Yeah, the banana is not so deep, maybe like like this much soil on top. Um, so I think it just it might it might have just taken off early, and, and that's what a right. That's uh, great. Yeah, j just to know because uh, this like of course if you plant the the whole banana, as some people do, then it might be bad for the corn. But usually, if the corn uh, first, I'm gonna deal with it, with the idea of the corn and the banana. Uh, but, but the corn. If it sprouts nicely and if it if it finds as much nutrients as it needs, it should be pretty big by the time the banana starts showing up, right? Because the banana takes from 15 to 30 days, and the corn, you know, by 45 days it should already be knee high, right? There's that old saying in the United States: corn should be knee high by the 4th of July. I'll never forget that. And the 4th of July is 45 days after they plant corn there. So, uh, and this is at least, I've seen many times corn with 45 days, you know, as big as chest high. Uh, so it shouldn't be a problem. Of course, if the corn by any reason, if it didn't find enough nutrients there, if it didn't, you know, take, if it didn't grow fast, it could, yes, be uh, um, outgrown by the banana, especially because the banana re-sprout, it's going to grow from accumulated reserves, right? So if the soil is not, uh, if it doesn't have nutrients, the banana will sprout fast and then it will stall growth, right? But then in this sprout fast, if the corn didn't take up, it, it might be left behind. Now, the thing more worrying, which you should, which you need to be careful, is with plants from the same stage of succession. And then at this point, it's really important to to understand the spa spatial distribution of these seeds. So, for example, jack beans, um, they need to be slightly off from the corn. They can't be like if you have jack beans and corn, if you have the seeds really close to each other, then the jack beans can completely eradicate corn. It can happen, it might not happen, but I always give at least 50 centimeters, not necessarily 50, but at least 30 to 40 centimeters of distance between one and the other, because when the jack beans open up its leaves, they won't be directly on top of the small corn seedling, right? And then once the jack beans start taking up more space, the corn has already managed to, to put its head out from the, from the stratum that the jack beans occupy. Jack beans with regular beans, they also either need a small spatial separation or you need to prune jack beans right in the beginning when it's got one or two leaves because they are so fast. 
and then regular beans, they also run the risk of being outgrown by the jack beans, depending on the density of planting. So in a small scale, the, the ideal management is to plant the jack beans and the beans when the jack beans releases its first true leaf, right? So not those first uh, sideway leaves, the first trifoliate leaf, you cut that one off because that's gonna give the jack beans a little growth stall and then the, the regular beans are gonna be able to, to grow. So that's usually the manager I do. When it's a small plot, of course, it's a large area This becomes impossible because you can't be just cutting every jack bean leaf so then what you can do is to kind of give it a more of a of a larger spacing between the the jack beans and the beans so uh, i want to add anything to now that's that's my experience if you want to to yes I'd add anything Sorry, I guess uh, a worker come in and I had to give him a quick instruction. Um, well, this is a good thing about jack beans that you can, you do have the security to come and prune them, right? So when you put them dense enough and it's a problem, you can always hold them back, like, like Felipe was said. Uh, I don't know, did you, did you plant these in, in the beds of this tree seedling like we've done in a few videos? You know, if, if so, this kind of distance that, we, that Felipe mentioned you know, usually I do like a triangle, you know, so you can have the corn on one end and on the other end, the bean, couple of beans. And so like triangles or squares. So it would be like 25, 30 centimeters at least away from each other. Uh, it, it seems like there has been some, some sort of deficiency, maybe from what, you know, we haven't seen it to, to the corn because the corn is very highly demanding. Sometimes even when the soil is correct, if the right rain information doesn't come through, even through irrigation, it's a different information you know, the rain information is key to the corn. You know, if, if, if you go through a couple of weeks with no rain, even with irrigation, the corn, there can be a bit of deficiency there. You know, the, nothing substitutes that kind of rain information. And then that could be the case. When, when we talk about annual crops as well, annual grains and things, it's always interesting to plant them in the alleys, in between the tree rows. So, so, so if I was going to plant, you know, like, annual beans and things like that, you know, maybe beans and corns, I could do that, you know, in the alleys. So then you wouldn't have the situation, right, and competing with all your other seeds, you know, because you want your jack beans to look after your seedling. You want that kind of abundance around your seedlings. But if you have, you know, some, some, some not so vigorous, you know, edible beans and things like that, you want to do a nice, you know, harvest of it, you know, down the alley is a good place to separate these kind of crops. Uh, so, so that's another pathway so that you can harvest jack beans and other annual beans with, you know, without them clashing, things like that. So, I mean, I think that's something. Yeah, that's a good stay. point. So, I'm, I'm going to so, be, so the... I'm going to be publishing next Saturday, I believe the video I, I will be publishing. It's about, the system that we implemented in the last quarter. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you guys the, the sketch of the system. And we, we planted exactly corn, beans, and jack beans as our placenta species. So you're going to be exactly how the spacing was done. So I think that's going to be, be, it's going to be good for you to check it out. And, and I'm excited to see a video, you know, show us some images. You know, whatever way you can, you know, we'd like to see it. How, how, you, how your plot is doing yeah, there. First. This is something well, that we... I'll make a video this week. I'll make a video this week. Yeah, this is something uh, that we... Well, well I want to say... Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, please, please. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, this is, this is what Philippe and I will be discussing and we'll be talking about it soon. Uh, you know, the, the community sharing your projects with us. You know, we really want to see what's happening. You know, our patrons, we love to, to see what's happening in your plots and that will make us closer and, you know, and, and as a community, you know, for us to interact in that, in that sense, we, we really got to want to boost this. We're going to discuss the right strategy for that. 
you, you had you had something you wanted to yeah the uh for sure I'm, i'll make sure to, to get a video post a video up this week um but a uh, the corn i don't know if maybe it's the seed uh, that i got which is maybe a little bit old maybe you know maybe not so good uh, but what you said about the rain because we had that like six weeks you know i planted it out we had some couple good rains and then it just went went dry you know and I was there and I was, I was watering it. And even I got to the point where I said, I might not, I might have to give up on the water and just let it go, you know, uh, just because we had a well and, and I was running out of water, you know, I was, I was using all the water for the house, but, um, how cold is it there? It, say again, how cold does it get there at this time of the year? No, no, uh, uh, maybe eight, 17, 18 degrees. Okay, not not too cold. No, no, no. Um, but um, but I think maybe maybe it was that in in the in the beans just responded a lot better to the drier conditions, and the corn just said, mm, you know, I'm not gonna grow. And then you know maybe like two weeks ago it started rain. We got good rains, and uh, and then now the corn is trying to take off again, but it, but the beans just out you know outgrew them. Um, but I want to ask a. So for the in the in the interest of the long term uh, system, it, it's it's preferable to to that the jack beans grow better. Is, is that what I understand? It? That they'll take care of the of the of the uh, seedlings better, um, and then maybe kind of like put to a secondary a plane the corn and the the annual production species. Does that make sense? I want to say this. So you don't have to. You can have all of them. Um, because, the, like I said, if the thing is, if, if the corn has lost already the, the train, that's it. it. It's gone. You know, if, if it, didn't, it didn't make it in the beginning, it's gone. You, you, you're going to have to let it go. Right. That, that's it. Uh, you are correct in. in in, in this that you're saying that yes the jack beans of all of these placenta species the jack beans and the pigeon pea they are the most beneficial to the system right that's the, they are let's say they're giving back something to the system whereas corn and beans they're of course they give something back but they're a lot more demanding right they they, they need resources for them uh, but you can have all of them Right, you can so you, so you don't have to to consider the other one as secondary. You you can have all of them, but your corn, if it um, maybe if you didn't have other plants around, you wouldn't lose it completely, but you wouldn't have a decent harvest because it didn't have that good startup anyway. So yes, it it, it does happen that if. I've had that with pineapple, for example. If by planting a, a bad seed, a, a bad slit of pineapple, right, a too too small of a slit, uh, it wasn't able to 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 grow along with all the other species that came around. So it was overshaded and it didn't grow. It was like one year afterwards, it was the same size. So you know, it lost the race. It couldn't uh, it couldn't follow up, follow the other species. So I lost it. So with agroforestry, you do, you have that additional risk and you ha we, we need to be careful with these things so that uh, um, we need to understand that this might happen. So that species that doesn't take off so well in the beginning, it might be left behind. And of course, if it is a perennial species, uh, it always has a second chance to catch up. But if it's an annual species, it doesn't. It only has that certain amount of time to, to grow. If it's not perfect, if those three to five months of the corn, mm -hmm. if it's not perfect, it's it's gone. You know, it's lost. Uh, try try think of the corn as is. It is quite a short term solution, so it's it's not gonna, for example, substitute pigeon peas, which will be there next year. You know, and and because it, they occupy similar kind of stratas. You know, and, and the corn occupies a, a, a different strata than the jack beans. So some things to, to be thought of, you know, the corn will give you a higher, you know, will be the emergent 
and and even though the jack beans come out really really booming in the beginning as well it doesn't go that high so it, it is like kind of the understory of the corn in that initial stage and then the pigeon peas will do that job that for the corn that the corn is doing you know in six months from now because they're quite slow in, off in the beginning so there's a few things to consider there um you know, whether to, to substitute it or to plant it in the future or not. I really appreciate planting corn initially because it gives me that, that strata in the short term before the pigeon peas, you know, yeah. it just it just have a little bit more spaced out from, from, from the jack beans, if, if it's the case. But, but as well, it's... Just for you to have an idea, because corn is it's a very, very... It's a peculiar plant in some, in some aspects. Like corn determines its production once it releases the fourth leaf. So when it's releasing the fourth leaf, if it's not a strong plant, it, it, you can do whatever you want, man. You can bring more manure, you can bring water, you can do whatever you want. It's, it's, it's lost because it's already starting to form its, its year at that time. You know, so it's... Uh, the, at, at the fourth leaf, it's the time you have to do an extra, you know, bring some extra manure, bring some extra water or whatever you need. If you don't do anything by then, it's very unlikely that it's going to recover. And this thing that Gennaro mentioned about the rain, uh, the thing about, about summer rains, especially summer rains, is that they, they, they fix a lot of nitrogen in the soil from electrical discharges. And corn is highly demanding in, in nitrogen. So if, if you're not planting corn, or if it's not raining, uh, you can give corn some additional nitrogen by, by bringing some chicken manure or some bone meal, or, I mean, not bone meal, blood meal, or some castor beans, uh, meal or you know anything that's rich in nitrogen once it sprouts if you have irrigation you can just give it a little bit of dose of nitrogen so that it gets that boost in the beginning another thing depending on the situation you want to have very close to the seed um, if you have a, a soil that's poor in phosphorus you want to have close to the seed a small deposit of phosphorus of bone meal or, or any other phosphorus source because phosphorus also helps a good start, you know, for, for plants to get a head start. Since phosphorus is responsible for, it's not responsible, but it's, it is essential for cell division. Uh, in order for rapid growth, plants need a, a, a decent amount of phosphorus uh, so that they can multiply their, their cells faster. And that, that guarantees maximum root growth and maximum growth in general so it, it gives plants a head start so this is you know a couple of things to, to think about because corn is pretty demanding for you to have good harvest of corn you need decent conditions of soil and, and nutrients i'm guessing it was probably planted as a service species i'm guessing so now, it's probably not the end of the, the, end of the world. Um, you might choose to mention there. If it's occupying a specific area, you feel like if you're going to take that, even though you, you know, if it's occupying that space, you know, if, it, if you're going to chop it off and even home the system, then you might leave it for a little bit longer. You know, so now it's your sensibility to, to make the call on when you're going to bring it down, basically. It, if there's corn that's like kind of struggling or, or maybe or even beans or whatever if it's just something that's kind of like not doing real well it's better just to just to cut it right i mean because that that information goes to the rest of the plants is that right you you can take it out if you see that there's no there's no there's no hope for it you can just cut it out cut, cut it down you know you don't necessarily have okay. to because it's like if it's if it's already left behind, it's not such a such a negative influence as a plant that occupies like the, the larger the space a plant occupies, the the worse the influence it is if it is unhealthy. 
you know, of course, if you if you cut it down, it's better. But if it's if it's very small, if it's underneath all the rest, it's not going to make a huge difference. Uh, it might not be right. worth Weed. the trouble of cutting it because it's very hard since it's very small. It's underneath the other plants. If it's a large area, it, it kind of becomes uh, uh, unnecessary. But let's say ideally, yes, you you cut it out, cut it down. You know, we see it like a weed at the moment. So just as we, I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes you're going to be, you know, weeding your, your bed. Sometimes you're like, oh, I shouldn't take that out because it's, it's a certain level of root structure. It's occupying a little space. Is this weed welcome or not? That's, I think it's in that kind of point of view that you, you've got to look at it. Exactly. That's a, that's a perfect comparison, actually. Look at it like a weed. That's good. Very beautiful. Okay, okay. I mean, because this corn that's like maybe I, I planted about 30 days ago, and, and this corn is, you know, a meter high. Uh, you know, there's real nice corn, uh, but just like maybe, you know, I planted like maybe six or eight seeds per nest. And oh, it's a meter and high. Very, and there's very, so it's doing very good. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty well. That's a different yeah. story. I'm there's thinking corn that's, like, that's, we, <laughs> just because of your bananas. Yeah. And then there's corn that's like, there's some that are maybe like this high, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, no, if, if the, those that are these this size at 30 days, forget about it. Yeah, you can forget about it. Yeah, definitely. And also, I recommend that if you planted eight seeds per 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 nest, the ones that look beautiful, probably there are two or three that look very beautiful, and another five around that are not so good. These ones, you take them out for sure. Leave the two or three most beautiful ones per nest. Oh, okay okay yeah because i mean i planted i think it might have been the seed because I, I planted you know six or eight seeds per nest and there's a most of the nest have maybe one or maybe two or three corns that are decent oh you know, okay. like you said okay um, so that's yeah so that's, that's so it might be the seed good, yeah yeah your seed was probably yeah, but, very uh, good it sounds to me like it was i mean a lot of seeds in the nest it could be Obviously. as well. It could. Is that yeah. is a personal no, no, but, thing? But, but if but if the seed wasn't good, it might. I mean, ideally, you're not going to do that. But it ended up being for the good because they didn't sprout very well, right? It had a very slow germination rate, so you know, like twenty percent or thirty percent. So anyway, it ended up being for the best that you planted so many. But with good seed, yeah. you're going to do two or three maximum, four at most. Okay. Yeah, I think I think just when, when I harvest this corn, then I'll, I'll just keep the best ones, keep the seeds, and then I'll just plant in the alley. You know, just exactly. have another, you know, in three or four months, put another alley crop. Cool. I want to tell you guys, man, eh, the uh, the whole idea, man, I don't know if it was if it was y'all's idea or, or the, ne the nest idea and, and just planting out every single – a, every single succession, you know, all together and just, and, 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 uh, you know, uh, fertilize one. And then it's, it's genius, man. You guys are the fucking, you know, the straight G units of agroforestry dog. I'm telling you, man. Uh -huh. And even with the, with the, the plant, the bananas and then planting the tree seedlings around. So the banana just takes care, man. I'll tell you, dude, that's that change my the whole i'm never planning anything alone ever again man because you just make one that's, hole and then you the fertilize Swiss everything man it's it's Amazing. the guy from switzerland man who who taught us this <laughs> as as Ernst's idea all right man that dude yeah, man i'll much. tell you <laughs> oh, that's he's a, just he's a, that's a he's, whole game changer he's from another he's from another planet and don't 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 you doubt that he doesn't tell us but he is <laughs> no doubt man no doubt probably, that's, he, he's, that's he's crazy probably, he's probably a survivor from atlantis and he's been around for twelve thousand years but you know just he knows it all just to touch up on that it's it's important you know that the next stage has been looked after you know because uh the pigeon peas the, the, the jack beans and and the corn and all of this is going to go so what's going to happen next year? What's going to happen in next in next drought? So you're always going to be onto it. If you're managing things, if you're pruning and you're really covering the soil, 
not initially, but always, just because be careful, because I've seen some abundance systems in the first year, and then, you know, some, then people relax, and then the drought comes, and then, you know, then, then you got a backward steps. Be on top of it, you know, be on top of, of your mulching, on your, on your alleys to, to create mulch, to feed back, because the eucalyptus are quite slow in the first year. The bananas as well. I mean, unless you've planted it for this, if you want to harvest, you, you, you would avoid pruning them in the first year. Obviously, we do a lot of systems where we're like double banana, want to prune, want to harvest and things like that. But, um, you know, keep up the good work with the next drought and the next drought and, and you know, have, have plans to, after the corn, after the, the, the jack beans, you know, what is the plan for, you know, in two years from now or, or in 18 months from now when the eucalyptus are still not producing in abundance? Obviously, the banana is our main ally, but then you need to plant in high density enough for this. And also the pigeon peas as well are, are really radical with, with, the, with, the, with the chop and drop. That's, that's a good ally for the next year. What I'm saying is because some of these uh, quick fix, some of them are of, of, of for the short, in the short term, like, you know, six months, you know, eight months kind of cycle. And then when you're going into your second drought, if there's no irrigation and things like that, you know, because we plant the nice tomatoes and everything there, but these tomatoes are not going to be here next time around. So, so just watch out, be on top of it, you know, and, and initially, you know, if you have the irrigation in the drought, you know, it goes a long way in the first and in the second year. And then after you can, you know, you can reduce, you can remove it, but, you know, be on top of things you know, after not, a, not just that first boom where everything's pretty, where you fertilize it and everything's booming, what's going to happen after this, you know, in, the, in your second drought where it's still 18 months old, just, just, you know, just be a tent and be, and be active pruning because if you're not, you know, it's very quickly can, you know, the drought can be very, very cruel. That's another thing I want to ask you guys. Um, I, I I can't get eucalyptus here that are are uh, are a decent price. Um, but the idea I had was I put a a, a glaricidia stake um, every two meters right next to the to the the nest, and then as well in between. And then and then there's so I, I put one nest and then thirty centimeters or fifty centimeters a papaya with like maybe. Uh, 20 or 30 tree seeds all different types uh, and then another 50 centimeters or, or, or 80 centimeters whatever and then uh, inga uh, acacia magnum and uh and um ir and, and, and eritrina it doesn't matter but anyway uh, do you guys think that, that that's going to hold the system in the in you know like a maybe a longer term the glare with the glaricidia and the inga and the uh you know, maybe like one decent biomass tree about every, yeah, you know, maybe two decent biomass trees, like one so every two minutes. Especially in the longer term, I'm more concerned about the shorter term because even things like avocado produce a decent amount of organic matter in the longer term, you know, and, and there's that period from the second to the fourth year, you know, that the eucalyptus really have your back. They really, because some of these from seed, you know, even the, the little cayennes, they're fabulous. That for me, it's the next up after the eucalyptus. But as well, they take a little bit longer, you know, all of these stuff, uh, you know, so there's that gap, you know, from, from, from the first year to the third year, you know, that, you know, you're not, you're not. The, you're the not. Ac Acacia Manjum and Gliricidia in your place will probably do the trick. Because oh, in Brasilia, they don't grow so fast, but your place is probably a little bit hotter. What altitude are you? 1,000, 1,000 meters. Okay, but you're closer to the equator, so it doesn't get so, so cold during the year. So th they're probably going to grow, especially the Acacia Manjum, should grow pretty, pretty nice in your system. Should produce quite a good chunk of organic matter. And uh, oh, okay. glaricidia as well, and er er Erythrina, 
in the long, medium to long term, it will also be a, quite an amazing plant to, to have around. I'd be very interested to see the pictures of how they're going to look like six months from now. You know? Yeah, I'm interested. It's going to be interesting. They, I want to ask you, the Cassia Magnum, when can you get the first prune? How long does it take to get the first to get the first prune? Well, in six months, did you plant it by seedling? Yeah, every, everything seed. No, no, just seed. Direct, I direct seed everything. Oh, the, the, uh, Acacia manjo is kind of a kind of a, it's a nasty plant to sprout. Uh, have they sprouted already? Uh, not yet, not yet. Mm. Yeah, it's hard, it's to, hard to get them to... Yeah, they're kind of... Because the seed is so small and hard. They're, these plants that are very... That have a very small seed, sometimes it's best to produce a seedling. But anyway, from seedling, in about six months, you should already be raising its skirt, you know, taking down some bottom branches. And, you know, a year and a half or so, it should be tall enough that you start kind of thinking about taking its top off you know, a year and a half to two years. If it grows as well as it, uh, which I think it will, it should in your place grow as, as fast as I've seen them growing in the south of Bahia. Uh, it should be a somewhat of a similar climate. Maybe yours is a little bit colder, but not, not too much colder. So Inga, it's a bit slower, you know, probably it's gonna take you three years to start needing two to three years to start raising its skirt and then five to six or seven years for you to start actually topping it off so one thing uh, you should look for senna species as well you probably senna they exist everywhere in all of the tropics and they're also an amazing plant especially senna senna siamea I always talk about that one because that's uh, that's just it's an amazing plant, man. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. See a man, see a man. Yeah, yeah. And it's some, beautiful. Some of these chop and drop trees, you know, you want to systematically have them, you know. So to plant them by seed and count, that you got to have them every two meters or every three meters. You know, so we appreciate planting them by seedlings to systematically guarantee, you know, that you're going to have this return on it. Because otherwise, if you have this gap, you know, what's feeding the system? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go. Let's move on to some questions that people asked here in the chat here in, in the in the Zoom chat. Actually, we just have one last comment from Peter uh, in the in the comment section of the Discord post. He said, actually, we have Patty, our representative from the, from Scotland, saying he couldn't make it to the Q&A. That's a pity, but we'll see next month. So Peter said, from Gennaro's comment on the profitability of agroforestry farms on the 4th of August this year, uh, hey, we find that when complexifying the system with a lot of biodiversity, it... Uh, it becomes less commercial, so we do suggest for profitable systems to be well designed with the focus on a main crop and on a secondary crop so that the commercial focus is more narrowed down. But ultimately, the answer is yes, when the principles are applied correctly, they do proportion leverage. This would be a great question for the Q&A. Yeah, this is exactly that what we discussed earlier during the Q&A. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think about making maybe a video of more extensively about this because I think it's such a great topic. And then we have a couple of questions here in the chat. Garrett asked if the avocados displace the bananas at some point or if you can keep growing bananas long term. Uh, Russell answered eventually the bananas will get shaded out and leave the system. That is correct. Theoretically, you can continue to grow some types of bananas um, as a medium stratum with the avocados, but that's theoretically because in practical terms, 
that's going to be very hard as you want to keep avocados uh, shorter so that you can harvest them more easily than if you if you're going to have your three meter tall banana or your four meter tall banana that as a medium stratum which some types of banana they are medium stratum and they belong to the secondary stage of a forest some of them then you're going to need to have your avocado as a high stratum taller you know with their canopy beginning at five or six meters so that becomes way too high for a uh, for a practical system but in theory you can i've seen it happening but in places where the avocado was not the main crop it was there as a not even a secondary species just for for producing avocados for the family so they were taller uh, they were pruned at like eight meters tall or something, so that it's possible. And do you still have another one from Gareth? Do you still have the long, long-term noble timber crop in a specialized commercial system? Always, always have the noble wood in any system um, because they're all emergent species. It's very rare that you will have a main crop that occupies an emergent stratum because most of them are not, they just don't belong to the, so most fruit trees, they don't belong to the emergent stratum. So it's always a good, you need, you need to occupy that place with something. So why not using a long term noble wood species, which can be pruned and it will produce organic matter and uh, it will help out the system. So definitely, Always have them around. Always have them around. Can I just ask, as far as the the choice of that emergent, um, like long term noble wood, is it possible that that there are some that don't like pruning and that will, when you do, kind of try to keep them at whatever height you want to choose, six meters or eight or whatever, that um, that they won't like the pruning and might just not do well, or they're maybe they're they're Prunings aren't so good for as a as a mulch. It's yeah. The the thing about their pruning not being so good for mulch, uh, not really. If if it grows well on the site, it it's going to be mobilizing nutrients. And it's, you know, it's not going to be a problem. As to them not liking pruning, if you had asked me a, a year and a half ago, I would say that is impossible, but now I can say it is possible, although rare. I've had the experience of, uh, of finding one species of tree, and, and it's not a noble wood species, right? But I, I found a species of tree which did not respond to pruning at all. And uh, some of them died after a not so radical pruning. And they, they were they were they were well established trees, and I pruned a couple of them. It's a species called Mukuje. It's endemic to the region where where I live, and I pruned them. Some of them died, and some of them, after a year and a half, have resprouted with a puny three leaves or something like that. Um, funnily enough. This tree is the one that shows up in the in the intro video, in the intro of all our videos. There is one. I'm at the top of the tree and I kind of roll the camera around. That's exactly the tree. So you know that day I was pruning it. That was a long time ago, and it looks the same until today, pretty much, except for a couple more leaves. So yes, it can happen. But more often than not, trees do respond well to pruning. What will vary is the intensity of pruning and the, well, yeah, the intensity of pruning. That's pretty much it. And how many prunes you can do a year. And then for noble wood trees, the one thing which is interesting to find is this, there are species which, if you cut off the whole canopy, right, without leaving any branch, as we usually do, just take the whole canopy out. 
some species will still re-sprout from only the tip of the main trunk. Other species, most of them, if you do this taken out of the whole canopy, it's gonna re-sprout from various heights in the main trunk. And that's very bad for, for, for woods because it's gonna create these, these nods in the middle of the trunk. Um, so for most species, you have to do a pruning, leaving some branches, like we have many vid videos about, as we do in eucalyptus. But it's always, always interesting to, to observe and test and find these species that allow for complete canopy removal, just because it makes it a lot, a lot easier to, to, to mechanize the operation if you can remove the whole canopy. So that's something interesting to, to be looking out for. Right. Okay. And at the right so time of the cool. year and things like that. Wait, what? Yeah. I didn't get. You, you, you said something now, didn't you? Uh, me, me. Well, well, also the right time of the year, you know, um, there'll be, there'll be a, an appropriate exactly. time which, which you, you're helping him to re-sprout, you know, not at, not <laughs> at the end. <laughs> At the worst times of year, where you know you're not helping it, maybe something like that. All right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Um, Peter. Peter posted a link here about rosewood. Uh, Eric, I don't know if you saw it already, but you probably want to take a look at it. It's uh, about the species I was talking about with, with about the oil. It's a pretty valuable oil uh, here in Brazil. It's sold for 2,000 reais the liter. That's about $400 uh, in today, I think. 400, 450 or something. So it's pretty cool. It's most of the production nowadays, it's, it's done by, uh, um, there, it's, not, it's not planted, right? People just take it from, from the native Amazon rainforest. So there's a, and th there has been a lot of research on planting rosewood, you know, in, in scale. So that's something to research. And you could have a system where you plant eucalyptus and rosewood, and your rosewood will take over the eucalyptus like seven or eight months down the road. So you can use the eucalyptus for a few years and then let the rosewood take over. Um, Peter said, maybe a list of potential biomass trees, depending on region, elevation, continent, could be interesting. Some kind of an overview with all the previous tips, like what best to plant, seed, seedlings, cuttings, where to prune. That's a quite interesting thing to do. And I will suggest this for you to help us out. In the Discord community, there is a channel called Species. Uh, we could try to stir something up there so that we get input for everybody. Of course, Janara and I could uh, try to bring all the knowledge that we have from, from works we've done and list those species. I actually, I think I have some, we have, we have some species listed in one of our PDFs, if I'm not wrong, but uh, we could definitely in, enrich that list and it would be good to receive input from people all over the world because there are certainly many species that we don't know about. But we can uh, definitely list many species for the tropics and subtropics. For temperate climates, I would, I would like to hear from other people as well as I have less experience with that. So, yeah. That's a, that's a good thing. We can it, try to it is a that case up where everybody. It is a case where we, we, we study this, you know, in different different areas of the world. You know, we mm -hmm. observe and we're trying to figure out. So it, it really is a team effort for us to to have like an extensive, uh, you know, list and, and things like that. Let's put it together. Yeah. And I think it's a good, pretty good idea. And we'll, we will gladly format the list once we have a good, um, a good input for everybody. 
uh, from you know from different parts of the world, and we can format into it into a PDF and make it available for everybody in in the Patreon community. I suppose you could just research invasive species, and we've got all our. That's answers. true. <laughs> the, the the list is probably already well established. Well established. Most of the plants that you know, if you put it on Google, the first things are going to come up. It's evasive. It's illegal, and you shouldn't plant it. If you go exactly. through that route, what's invasive on that particular terrain, we got we we that's a big clue. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, that's a, that would be a pretty good list to have, definitely. All right, guys, I think we can wrap it up. Um, we've we've, been, we've gone for uh, an hour and a half. That was pretty good. Yeah, Our was YouTube to... uh, live views was, was very it was very quiet this time usually we have some more action but uh maybe people are sleeping today um or maybe they're they're getting released from covid restrictions and they're spending their saturdays out in the streets or something but uh yeah sorry right. so it was All great right. anybody, to meet, anybody to meet you guys. Wants to... Great to see you, Jill. Great to meet you, Peter. And yeah, uh, great to pretty cool back to see you new faces here. Russell, Eric, everyone. We miss Jack today. Gareth, did you notice that now I, I oh, take thanks. part of the radical, radically pruned hair group? <laughs> I've got more hair than you. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> A tiny bit. <laughs> It's, yeah, I'm gonna yeah. have to uh, go like you today. I think time for a shave. Time for I'm a shave. going. For I the like the look right now. Good. Actually, I, and with the beard. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right, guys. Uh, it's been great, and we'll see each other very soon next month. And that's it. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you so much. Guys. I've learned a lot. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, Joe.